legal program that actually talks to you about what goes on in the criminal justice system in a way that you can potentially understand and learn from, something that you can grow from. This is what we're doing here. We're planting seeds so that the next generation and this generation can save itself from what I believe is the most vicious system known uh, uh, to man. Uh, and believe me, since you are the target of that particular system, most of you, if you're young, black, uh, undereducated, I didn't say uneducated, undereducated, because sometimes street smarts is better than court smarts or book smarts, so you might be undereducated in the system. So what I want you to do is sit back and learn what the system does and what it really is about. If you have that, if you're armed with that kind of knowledge, inshallah, you'll be able to move in a way that begins to change the dynamic in the system. One of the things that the system does best is it depends on your lack of knowledge. It depends on the idea that you don't know what's going on. When you hear certain terms, you think you understand what's going on, but there are things going on so far behind the scenes, so far that have existed for so many years in the system that it, it really, by the time you get to knowing what it is that hits you, you're already smashed. Uh, so let me welcome you all. Uh, again, this is... Uh, the Raw Law Project is at RadioOnFire.com. You should always check out Radio On Fire with my man DJ Diamond. He's my executive producer. He always makes me sound good. Um, I don't know what can make me look good, but Allah knows best. In any event, uh, I want to do something, um, uh, and I, I'm going to add this to the show. Each week, I'm going to try to add something different. Now, you know I believe in Dr. King's evaluation of of America as being the greatest, the government being the greatest purveyor of violence in the, uh, on the planet, but I also believe in his uh, admonition that we have to have a radical revolution of values. And so one week we started out with respect, the next week we talked about value. And I'm going to finish each show with that. I'm going to start out each show with just a little small commentary about something that I know is going on in the news because, again, uh, last week I played an excerpt for, from you from uh, El Haj Malik El Shabazz Malcolm X. And I played that in a particular context on this generation of leadership trying to understand what the generation and the generations before them brought and left for them to learn and whether or not we in fact learned it. And so since I believe those, that generation was the most profound generation to impact on the black community and the black experience in America, uh, I, I, I like to go back to them often to be able to see what other lessons can be drawn. And what Malcolm was talking about was how the press um, can criminalize a whole community. And it can make you think that, he used to say that what you can make what's good seem to be bad and what's bad seem to be good. And one of the examples he used was that in World War II, uh, the US went to war in World War II and entered that war and the enemies were the Japanese and the Germans. And the friends were the Chinese and the Russians. Following the war, the friends became somehow the Japanese and the Germans, and the enemies became the Russians and the Chinese. The people who helped us in World War II, who fought the World War II, who lost the most people in World War II, trying to save the world from fascism, and from Nazism, and from white supremacy on that level, uh, somehow became the enemy, and some the people who pr promoted fascism and, and white supremacy and, and uh, extermination of various races, uh, somehow became the friend. And it was done through a quick manipulation of the press. Now, why do I say that? All week I've been reading something that I think has been really targeted at uh, our community. And I, I don't really like to follow uh, pundits and things like that, but I do like to see what trends do. And one of the trends was this whole concept of, what, of whether or not Donald Trump is a racist. Uh, I don't really care one way or another about Donald Trump uh, being a racist or not a racist, etc. I don't think I know uh, very many um, people who have been leaders in America who aren't racist. Uh, the question is, how ignorant is the racist in exposing what it is that is his racism? I mean, I don't think he's any different in my mind than Bill Clinton. All you got to do is go back and look at Bill Clinton's State of the Union address on immigration, and you get the exact same words as Donald Trump gave. Uh, all you have to do is look at uh, George Bush's uh, record and, uh, and Ronald Reagan's record on how they treated the black community with their crime bill and Richard Nixon's, and you'll see that there's not a whole lot of change. But see, what happens in the media is they are now redefining racism for you, for you, the black community. See, because at the end of this, it, it, Africa and Haiti and these so-called shithole countries, that was designed for you. 
that comment was designed for you. And, and look, everything that you look at in America, if you don't see yourself in it, you are missing it. Uh, you are missing the boat. You are missing the story. It has always been about you. Somehow you're locked in, in the middle of it because you're the economic voice, the economic impetus of this country, and therefore somehow you are connected to it. Uh, so please, always when you hear these kind of commentaries, they are always, always think that they are directing it toward me, They're not directing it to some, some Africans and some Haitians, etc. They are addressing it to you, you the so-called black man and woman here in America. Now, how does that play itself out? This is just my little short commentary and then we'll get into the subject matter of today. Racism, they're trying to define as the guy with the hood, the guy who runs people over at Charlottesville, the guy who used to lynch people, the guy who uh, called himself a clanner, uh, John Burt Society kind of person. When in fact, racism, white supremacy, is a concept that has been around for so long that even the poor white and the rich white share the same ethos, the same emotion, the same pathology that they are superior simply because of the color of their skin. And that color of their skin put them in a preferential position. And that preferential position gives them the right to make decisions as it relates to other people. So whether Donald Trump is president and outlandishly bold about his racism, I mean, he even comes out and says, I'm the least racist person that you met. In, in other words, I'm racist, but I'm least racist than the people that you meet. And he never denied being racist. So why are we discussing it is beyond me. But how is he any different because his education is the same education that Hillary Clinton has? His education is the same education that 95% of America has. It's just that white America is in the position to exercise power that pushes their race forward and pushes other races back. That's what makes it racist. And so if you can go to your school, your local school, and you can find you a teacher that doesn't have a European teacher, white teacher, that doesn't have the ability to put their agenda forward, let me know. If you can go to a, a, a college and find a professor that doesn't have the ability to put his agenda or the agenda of what it is to be white in America forward as if it has validity for other communities, let me know. Because I'm telling you that that's the nature of racism. That they are racist because they are taught to be racist and they're unapologetic about it because they don't see it except when they see it when, in the form of a hood or an orange president or someone calling out other countries and other cultures. But the racism is embedded in the system and everyone who is in the system either is a participant in it or a victim of it. And we have got to stop allowing other people to define terms like racism out of the box of what it is that we deal with each and every day when we go down to the welfare office or we go to the bank or when we go to uh, pay our rent or, or, or anything, anything like that, we go to buy some property, especially in some places like Baltimore and North and stuff like that. So please, don't fall victim to the propaganda of the redefining of racism. It has existed it's, it, since day one here where they say, if you're white, you're all right. If you're black, get back. Don't fall victim to someone else telling you that this guy is a racist, as opposed to that the system is his systemically racist in and of itself. Now, with that said, last time we talked about the law, and this is a law show. Last time we talked about the law, we talked about you having a lawyer, uh, what it's like to get a lawyer, um, uh, some of the things that the lawyers have to go through, etc. because you just got arrested. You're in trouble. Uh, one of the things that you know is that when they put those cuffs on you, you're not going anywhere. I mean, you can fight, you can scream, you can scratch, whatever, but do whatever you want to do, but you're not going anywhere. You're going to jail. You're going somewhere where you're going to be in custody. You need a lawyer. Make sure you get a lawyer. If you can't afford a lawyer, a lawyer is supposed to be appointed for you by virtue of the Constitution. Now, the question is competency. Do you have someone who you believe is competent? I've been in jurisdictions where when you show up at that first time in court, that uh, it's called an arraignment. Arraignment is once you get indicted. We talked about the grand jury process and the indictment. And so that you know, I, I, I left this out, so I want to add this. So you make sure you go back to your notes, grab your notes and look at it. In, when an indictment comes down, 
Remember I told you, the prosecutor has complete control over the grand jury. They get to decide what evidence comes in, and they get to decide basically the impact of that particular evidence, whether they're going to stress it, or whether they're going to leave it out, whether they're not going to accent it. That's why the whole expression, a prosecutor can indict a ham sandwich. But the defense is not there. There are no defense attorneys in the grand jury to question witnesses. This is why it's a strictly prosecutorial function. And again, I gave you the example of the, the make-believe boxer, Mike Lyson, who this lawyer, who was a tax lawyer, decided to let him go to the grand jury, and he got smoked in the grand jury only to have that grand jury testimony really smoke him when he went to trial. So again, remember, it's a prosecutorial function. What else is a prosecutorial function? You begin your first adversarial process, part of the adversarial process, with your lawyer at your arraignment. Now, many of us can't afford to hire a lawyer. So when we walk into the courtroom for that first arraignment, we're probably meeting our lawyer for the first time. It may be a public defender. As I told you before, and as I say in the book, my book, Raw Law, an Urban Guide to Criminal Justice, and it's also Raw Law, a Hip Hop Guide. When the corporations got a hold of it, they changed it to Urban uh, because they felt like it was too black, just between you and I, and truth be told. But you live and you learn. So. Uh, so they changed it, and they did some interesting things with it, but they didn't, I, they, I didn't allow them to change the content. The content stands for what it stands for. When you go into that courtroom, an arraignment means that they are going to tell you what you are charged with. If you get that preliminary arraignment based on the complaint, it's going to tell you what's in the complaint. That's why I said read the complaint. Someone posted a video right on the heels of me giving that particular discussion of a kid who goes to, I don't know, somewhere up in north, was it Rochester or or somewhere in Maine or something, and this judge reads the complaint, and he's, the judge is like, wait a minute, the kid is saying, I didn't do any of this, it happened at one o'clock in the, in the morning, um, I was at a club, I was charged with loud music or something like that, and the cops report said it happened at 12 noon or one o'clock in the afternoon, and the judge was a little bit skeptical, but then he read the complaint and realized that the cop had put down the wrong statute, as I told you, that's where they make a lot of their mistakes, police officers, so if you read it, you know you'll be able to say, if it, doesn't, if it does get to the point of an indictment, you're able to go back to that document, pull it out and say, did you write this under oath? You got a credibility question, an argument that you can win. It may not be the, the, the one that, 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 that cuts the case, that, that wins and blows the case out the water, but it may be just enough to establish that this cop is not being credible and that's really what you want. Reasonable doubt is to establish a reasonable doubt, especially when you're innocent. All right, so they posted that video when the judge read it, read the complaint. He realized the, pro uh, the cop had put down the wrong statute. He wrote something with a charge and the wrong statute for that, and he threw it out because he had to. He had no choice. So you can get arraigned on a complaint, meaning that they tell you what the charges are. They read you the charge and ask you, what do you plead? Most people at that point enter a plea of not guilty. But what would you do if they read you your charges and the public defender comes over to you or your lawyer and they say, look, you can go home right now if you take this, if you just admit to X, Y, or Z. Otherwise, the judge is going to set a bail. You're indigent. That's why you got a public defender, because you can't afford to hire a lawyer. And the judge says the bail is $1,500. Cash only bail. Cash bail. I mean, you can't put up $150 bucks and get a bondsman to put it up for you. You got to come up with $1,500 to make this bail. The majority of pleas Listen to this closely. The majority of plea bargains, pleas, people entering guilty pleas to cases come when they realize they can't make bail. Whether you did the crime or you didn't do the crime becomes irrelevant at that point. I got a job. I'm about to lose my job. I got a, 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 my, my daughter's home. My daughter's sick. I'm taking care of my mother. I got, I, I got bills to pay. I got this. I can't afford to be out. I, I can't, you know, I can't afford to sit in jail. I'm a, I'm a crip in a blood town. I can't afford to be going to that county jail. Ain't nothing but bloods there. That's when they take that plea. Now, the reason why I'm telling you that is because you, everybody thinks the arraignment is something like, okay, it's, it's a performance. It's like, okay, it's, you go in, you say not guilty, boom, you're gone. But when they set that bail on you, and you can't afford to make that bail, you go into the jail until you make bail. The most infamous case, obviously, is uh, Khalif Browder case, I believe it is, out of New York, 
where the kid is in jail for three years because he can't make bail. And it wasn't a steep bail. It wasn't like it was, you know, a bail was a million bucks, but his family could not afford to make bail. During that three years, he was tortured, he was beat up, he was smashed by guards, he was locked in solitary confinement at 17 years old. So he goes in at 17, he comes out at 19 years old, 20, mentally disturbed. He eventually winds up committing suicide. All of a sudden, everybody's into something called bail reform. But this has been going on for forever. It's been going on for forever. And it's been going on because they, they, what they attempt to do, what they have done with the criminal justice system, is they have criminalized poverty. If you're broke, you don't get the same justice that you get if you're rich. It's just that simple. If you're broke, you have to deal with a system that is so totally different than the person who has money to be able to defend in that system. So someone who can make bail is defending their case from the street. If you have some, who I want to say, I, I, the word is an integrity, but if you have just some anger in you that says, I am not pleading guilty to this, no matter what, and you sit there in the county jail, there's no telling when you're going to get your indictment, when you're going to get your call back for trial. I got a friend. Uh, who sat in jail for a year and a half. He was accused of going into a corner store, a corner store we grew up with. And apparently they said he tried to rob the store, etc. But what happened was the, 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 the guy who owned the store, East Indian man, new to the community, uh, made a racial slur, and he confronted him about it. So when they called the cops, they said he tried to rob the store. When they finally got around to the people, finally got around to him, a year and a half later, because he refused to take a probation plea on something that he didn't do, a year and a half later, they dismissed the case against him. He sat for a year and a half, 18 months, based on principle. Imagine he hadn't seen his child, his children. I mean, you know, they come up to the jail to see him, sure, I mean, but that's not like hugging him for if you celebrate Christmas or Thanksgiving or the Eid or you pray with them, or whatever else you do with them. That's just nothing like that. You don't. You take a man out of his home, and, and then you got your son who's growing up saying, my dad's in jail, and you got to say that when he gets to school on uh, parent-teacher day, and they ask you, what did your father do? And you want to say he plays for the Knicks, you know, or, or that he's a, he's a businessman, but really he's in jail. And your kid is making up all kinds of excuses, et cetera, as to what dad does or what dad did. And the kid is embarrassed, and so the kid is already growing up with a stigma. And there's another side to that. Every year, you hear about a particular community being a high crime neighborhood. I want you to think about this. 600,000 stop frisks in New York in one year. 600,000. There aren't 600,000 kids in that area of New York. 600,000, though. In Baltimore, it was 140,000 stop frisks. It has stopped you for no reason, pat you down. This is what the consent decree and what the uh, attorney general investigation determined, that they were randomly stopping people and violating their rights. What happens when, with the people who you arrested randomly violating their rights for old, sitting on the wrong stairs or for uh, uh, being in the wrong, beat out past, past curfew? or uh, resisting arrest because they refused to come to you and you said come here because you're a cop. And you got all these arrests stacked up. And the kid goes in and you say, look, your bail is $300 and he can't make it, his mom can't make it. And so he has a choice to make. Do I plead guilty to resisting arrest? Do I plead guilty to disorderly conduct even though it's gonna get me home? Because, because it's gonna get me home. And that goes on as a, as a statistic in your community. Now you have a statistic for a criminal conviction, a crime being committed in your community that really never was a crime. It was part of an orchestrated plan called Stop Frisk, called Broken Windows Policing, called whatever it's called. All you have to do is go back and understand what really happened in the aftermath of Mike Brown's death. And the aftermath of Mike Brown's death, they went into Ferguson, Missouri. And they began to investigate, and they found out that what was going on was that they were ticketing and stopping and harassing young black men, and especially black men, and they would give them tickets and summonses and things like that, and then give them fines, knowing that they couldn't pay the fine. And then when they couldn't pay the fine, they would charge them with contempt, meaning they have a criminal record, 
And then they would use that way of, one, penalizing the poor, gaining money, and incarcerating black men out of the job market. Because the critical question is now, once you have a criminal record, you can't get public housing, you can't get loans, you can't get uh, uh, student uh, federal funding, for student aid. You can't even have a driver's license. Think about this. You can murder someone, be charged with murder, and still keep your driver's license, but you can't sell drugs and keep your driver's license. Or you, I mean, how silly are some of these laws? But again, they target a particular community, and they were targeting our community. So we have to understand the importance of arraignment as to what is going to happen when you walk into that room. The minute you hear, if you take this plea, you have a decision to make. You're much better off if you know that that decision is coming when you get there than you are if you get there and you're hit with it. You know, So that means once you get that lawyer, once you know who that lawyer is, and again, sometimes I was a public defender, so I know what it's like to grab 10, 15 files and have to walk down and talk to people and only have 10 minutes with them before a judge calls the case up and says, um, enter the plea or not guilty on your behalf, I'm setting the bail at $2,000. And then you try to make an argument, judge, this guy, he's an indigent. Then what indigent means is that he can't afford counsel. So if he can't afford counsel, what makes you think he can afford bail? So there are, it doesn't make sense, it doesn't add up. Because bail is only supposed to be that thing that ensures your presence in court, it ensures your return to court. So that bail reform, which is in place now and, and around a lot of places around the country is supposed to be designed to make sure that you can return to court without being punitive against the poor. But believe me, what do I always tell you? If every black man who, who hustles got together on a Wednesday and said, we're not going to sell drugs anymore on Wednesday, on Thursday, they'll pass a law saying it's illegal to, pass, to, it's illegal to conspire to not sell drugs on Wednesday, Wednesdays. And so you can bet that behind every reform that the legislature makes, that there's an economic motive, meaning they let people out of jail because it's costing them too much to keep people in jail, and that there'll be another backlash coming from the other side. Like, for example, in Baltimore, they have bail reform, where a lot of people charged with misdemeanors are getting what they consider to be released on their own recognizance or released to a bracelet or released to a program or something like that where they don't have to post a bail. On the other side of that is the what they consider to be so-called violent crimes or gun crimes. Person caught with a gun. Now they get to the point where they're saying, we're not even going to give this person a bail. That's the opposite side of that. So you think you're winning on one end and you're losing on the other one. And you don't think that police officers who may not have your best interests at heart don't know these rules. By the way, did any of you read about the sheriff's officer in, uh, in, I think it was Los Angeles this weekend, it was Los Angeles, who was busted because he was running a racketeering network, the biggest racketeering network in LA, was being run out of the police department? Yeah. I mean, so, so you get an understanding as to what we're dealing with as a community, all right? Because you won't, you won't say, nobody will say that if the police station is at one Lincoln Avenue, that one Lincoln Avenue is a high crime neighborhood. All right, but they'll say it if it comes out of my house that my house is a high crime neighborhood. And so again, take the arraignment very seriously. Be armed, be ready. Make sure you have a lawyer. And if you don't have a lawyer and you have a public defender, make sure that public defender is ready, armed, to discuss bail. Make sure that person is ready to discuss your case. Even if you don't know why you were arrested, when that judge gets up there and he starts speaking all fast and everybody's talking fast and all the words seem to be going over your head, stop the proceeding if you have to. Hold it. I don't understand, judge. I didn't do anything. I want to talk to my lawyer before we enter any kind of a plea, not guilty or whatever, you know, and make sure that he knows or she knows that this, whatever it is going on here is not fair and make sure that they tell the judge that. When you're dealing with bail, sometimes you get the opportunity to file what's called a bail motion, meaning you can put a motion in front of a judge with a package, they come up with a bail package, and the feds, they actually do a full investigation or as full investigation as they can. But in most states, you're able to put together a package and say, these are all the good things as to why you should give this person bail, because it guarantees his return. It demonstrates his character. It demonstrates his church going. It demonstrates that he's the imam. It demonstrates that she loves her children, that uh, she's the sole provider, this, that, and the third. All these good things that suggest 
give this person either a, a low bail or no bail because they are, the, the purpose of bail is to return, to make sure that the person returns to court. Sometimes you would think that if I say I'm coming back to court, I'm coming back to court, you know? I mean, and, and most people do. Most people just don't take off and go to North Carolina. Come on. I mean, come on. You can't afford to hire a lawyer. You can't afford to go off to Mexico. I mean, you can't hitchhike that far. So you have to come in and face the music. You have to hope you get a good quality representation. You have to hope that there's a lawyer out there who believes in what it is. And if you're a criminal and you know you did it, you know eventually it's the price of the game for you to get locked up. But what you want to do is to make sure you have quality representation. And I told you before, go watch the lawyer you're about to hire. Watch them work. Send people you trust to watch them work if you can't make bail, if you can't get out. Watch them work. Watch the kind of respect that they garner. Listen to what they have to say. I don't mean, look, I know some cats that's the loudest cats on the planet. They come into court and they be raising all kinds of you know what. Oh yeah, make themselves sound. You know, what they're doing is it's a commercial. They are doing a commercial. They got 20 cards in their po pocket and they figure if they come out and they be the loudest lawyer in the building, boom, you'll be like, ooh, he know what he's talking about. And the judge is in chambers laughing at him. Did you hear that fool? I mean, who is he grandstanding for? See, they don't know the hustle. You think it sounds good. You think it sounds worthy. And then he gets to trial and he just craps right on the floor. He does that My Cousin Vinny thing. You ever seen that My Cousin Vinny where the guy gets up and he pats the boy in the back, pop, pop, and he walks up and he says, Yeah, right. Believe me, I've seen it just like that. So when I, every time I see that movie, I just applaud whoever wrote it. I said, whoever wrote it must have been a criminal defense attorney because that stuff happens. And it happens far more often than you're, willing to, than you're ever going to see because everybody can't do criminal justice work. Everybody can't take someone's life in their hands and stare down 12 people and say, my guy didn't do it. They don't have any proof that they did it and challenge cops and witnesses with every word that comes out of their mouth. And I'm not talking about just like, okay, well, you know, if we, if we, I mean, literally have lawyers who tell me, well, yeah, but if I question them too hard, they're gonna think that I'm really picking on this witness. <laughs> I shake my head, it's like, really? <laughs> if the people are here in jury duty and they don't understand that it's your job to do this and you don't understand it's your job to do this, to point out that the person is a liar or not telling the truth or is mixed up and confused in their truth, then you don't need to be here. You need to be like writing novels or something like that. Speaking of that, I'm writing a novel now. That's, that's, that has nothing to do with my skill level, all right? Um, but that's what it is, arraignment. Take it seriously, you know? Take it seriously, understand that someone is potentially going to set a bail on you. So the minute you get arrested, you have to begin to click in. Let your emotions go. Understand what the process is going to do. You're gonna be charged. You're gonna see that complaint. You're gonna read that complaint. You're gonna get a lawyer. That lawyer is going to read the complaint. You and the lawyer are going to talk. If it's a public defender, you may only have 10 minutes. Great, but some of the best work I've ever seen was done in 10 minutes. And some of the worst as well. But that's the same thing if you have somebody that you pay. Some of the best work is going to be done because they, have no, it's because they understand the process and they believe in it. They believe in doing it right. And some of them just don't have any character. So they're going to mess it up no matter what they do. They're just going to take your money and, and, and dash. You know, I got a, um, I got a cousin right now. Right? Charged with uh, uh, a misdemeanor. And she uh, calls me, I need some help. I called this lawyer and he tried to tax me for $7,500. Now, being in the process, I was like, hon, that's a one day, that's, that's a, you'll be in court one day and you won't be in court 15 minutes. You feel like paying him $7,500, give it to me. I'll, I'll, I'll tell somebody what to do for you. I'll walk some kid through it. I mean, this makes no sense. You wouldn't do that. But that's what it is. That just shows you that, in my opinion, that that's a lawyer who really didn't care about that. He was caring about the dollar. And, and I'm not against lawyers making money. That's what they're in it for. It's a profession. It's your job. It's your business. You got to pay your bills, too. But that's taxing. And we have to come to an understanding that we are in a community that cannot bear being taxed. We have to come with, we have to come with the best even when we don't get paid the best. I'm just going to put it out there like that. After your arraignment, you have the copy. Of, if, if it's an arraignment on a complaint, you'll get a copy of the complaint. If it's an arraignment on the indictment, that's a funny kind of a situation because most lawyers will come in and they say, Your Honor, I waive reading of the indictment into a plea of not guilty. I had a client ask me one time, he says, so, 
why, why, why are we waving the reading of the indictment? Don't they, don't they have to read it to me? I said, brother, you know how many charges you have on this indictment? He says, uh, yeah, you gave it to me. I said, didn't you read it? He's like, yeah. I said, you want the, everybody in the courtroom to know that you are charged with 10 rapes and 10 armed robberies and four counts of possession of a weapon? Do you want everybody to hear that? That's what the wave it means. He doesn't have to read it again because you already read it. So when a lawyer says, I'm waving a reading, that's all he's doing. Now, some judges will mess with you. I mean, like, for example, when you get into these major cases, these big time cases, some judges love the grandstand. So they'll get up there and they'll say, your client is charged with and count one, murder in the first degree, that on such and such and such date, uh, he did uh, intentionally and knowingly gun down on the streets of so and so and so. I mean, really make you look bad. Really make you look bad, because he knows the press is watching, etc. And if you open your mouth, they really try to make you look bad. They'll read the whole thing out there in front of everybody. So when a lawyer says he's waving a reading of the indictment, that's not selling you out, at least not yet. That's just his way of saying, let's get on to the real work that has to be done. The real work that has to be done is reviewing that indictment for sufficiency. The indictment comes from the grand jury. The grand jury, once they hear the evidence that's presented by the prosecutor, they vote on the charges that are given to them to see if they're consistent with the evidence. That's what their mandate is. That's what they're supposed to do. When you get that indictment, you then should go get the grand jury minutes because that might be your very first pre-trial challenge. If the grand jury voted, if the prosecutor presented uh, butterscotch is a candy, and they charge you with peppermints, illegal possession of peppermints, and there's no evidence of peppermints in the grand jury, the only way you'll know that is if you read the grand jury minutes. If you never read the grand jury minutes, you're wind up standing trial for peppermints and getting convicted for peppermint, not knowing that peppermints were never presented to the grand jury. Butterscotch were presented to the grand jury. But you might have waived that right, that opportunity, by electing to go to trial. But that's what your pre-trial motion practice is all about. Once you get your indictment, you read it over carefully. You read it over with an eye toward just understanding what the charges are. Now, if you're smart, if you're a good lawyer, and I'm talking to the lawyers right now, and I know some of you are listening because I keep getting emails and texts from you. When you're smart, you read it over the first time just like you're reading over the newspaper. Don't get caught up in any of the superfluous language. Read it. Read it like you're reading the newspaper, like it's a story. Because what it'll do is just familiarize you with it. That's all it will do. You're not going to solve the problem then. By the third time that you read it, if there's some discrepancy that you want to see, you begin to take notes and jot notes on the cover. I used to always fold mine over like this here, count one, and I would write, you know, da 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 da, write it on here. Because I want to challenge count one, you know. I would challenge count one. I want to see if count one and count two are the same thing because that's called duplicity. I'm charging the same thing in two counts with same evidence. They indicted them twice on the same thing. No, I want that off the record because I don't want a jury hearing two counts of murder when it's really only one count of murder. All right? I don't want to hear two armed robberies when it's really just one armed robbery. You understand? Um, and so the, the more times that a jury, because the jury eventually, if it gets to trial, is going to hear the indictment. They're going to read the indictment and the charges to the jury. And the more charges that they hear, the more likely jurors with their human selves are going to say something like, well, he must have did something. He wouldn't be here if he didn't do something. All right? And for those of you on Facebook, I see that the, the thing just froze. So you can go to radioonfire.com and pick me up. Uh, but that's the issue. So you read it carefully. And again, we're talking strategy here now because I want you to win. I want you to win. You understand? And, and I know. Look, I know what victims are thinking right now. People who are victims of crime are thinking like, you're giving them inside tips so they can beat the case because this cat just killed my son. And he's going to be able to beat it on advice that you give. No, 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 no. This is for victims too. I want you to understand what's going on in the process so you're not surprised when you see good defense work versus sloppy defense work because you are saying, so-and-so killed my son based on evidence that the prosecutor told me that he did, unless, of course, you witnessed it. All right? And if you didn't, then you're relying on the state's case. 
But what if you find out that the state is just absolutely lying? I mean, how much of your history, especially if you're in the black community, where they just withheld evidence that showed that someone was innocent? How many times do you have to wait 15, 20 years for DNA evidence to come back and say he didn't commit the crime? After the, the Central Park Jaga case, you would have thought that everybody would have understood what goes on in criminal justice, especially the preliminary parts of it. But no, that went right just like we do with our black leadership, with the people who set down the framework on how to succeed as leaders in America, we do the same thing with criminal justice. That went right past us. Like it's, okay, what? They got five young boys from out of a park, browbeat them all to confessing into something, a crime that they could not have committed, had no evidence of it other than their confessions, convicted all of them, had them all do at least seven years in prison, only to find out that there was someone else who did it and he winds up confessing and his DNA winds up matching even though his DNA was in the system all along. You would have thought that everybody would have picked up on criminal justice as to what really goes on with interrogations. You would have picked up what goes on in prosecutions. You would have picked up what goes on in defense work by looking at that. But we treat it as drama. We treat it like as Atticus Finch. So we can turn it off and come back and watch it again tomorrow and be excited by it. It's not the practice. It's real life. Real lives are being affected by this. Real victims have to come back and say, who did it if he didn't do it 15, 20 years later when the guy gets released from prison? When do I get a chance to heal if I'm a victim? I'll tell you a story. I was in Bridgeport, Connecticut on a uh, racketeering case, murder racketeering case. And this woman is staring me down. The courtroom is packed. I do my cross-examination of this witness. And this woman is staring me down so much to where I can feel it. I can really feel her, um, her eyes on me. And if those of you who know me know how I am. I don't, I don't play when it comes to, uh, one, when it comes to being in courtroom. I, I, you know, I laugh and joke, um, but it's all part of who I am. I, I don't, I'm not different in my opinion from the personality of who I am. You know, I just have to adjust to be aggressive, more aggressive in a courtroom, but I'm not more, less aggressive than I'm on a basketball court, but I'm gonna do the job the best I can, and God knows best. But I see this woman staring at me, I'm catching out of the corner of my eye, so I say to my client, who is that? And he leans over to me, he says, that's so-and-so's mother. I said, the boy who's dead? He's like, yeah. During the break, I get up, I walk over to her, I sit right next to her. I mean, you could see like hatred all in her eyes. And I said, hi. I said, um, do, um, do we know each other? My name is Muhammad. She said, real coldly, no, we don't know each other. And I said, look, I, I can't help but notice that you're staring at me. I said, is there something that I should know um, about you and I? I mean, is there something that you want to tell me that uh, you know can help me not feel like I have to worry about you when I walk out this room. And she took like a real deep breath the way sisters do like, like that Negro please look, you know what I mean? Like, and then she says, you know what? I'm really not, I'm angry, but I'm really not angry at you. She said, but your client killed my son and I know he did it. And I just hate the idea that you could possibly get him off. And I said what I say to everyone as it relates to the system. I don't get people off. I do the job of representing. I'm gonna do my best to make sure that if the evidence isn't there to prove the person guilty, that everybody in the room knows that the evidence isn't there. That if people are lying on the witness stand and calling it justice, I'm gonna make sure that the lie is exposed. Once that happens, the system says, you create a reasonable doubt based on the evidence that person has to walk. You have to let him go. And I said to her, you, whatever happens, you leave that in the hands of the law. I said, but I can't back off on this because the evidence is not there. Do you understand? And she said, nobody ever explained it to me like that before. Yeah, I understand. She sat through the whole trial. I didn't get any other stares. But the point being is that victims 
don't understand the system any more than criminals understand the system. And that's unfortunate. And until we get to the point to where we understand what's going on in the system, that is a false illusion of justice, then we are going to be battling back and forth within our own community because our community is the target. And if we're the criminal, then who's the victim? It has to be another member of our community. If you selling, if you hustling, you selling drugs in our community, who are you selling it to? If you robbing and you robbing in our community, who are you robbing? If you get locked up for robbing and you go to prison and you were the one supporting the household by virtue of your hustle or by whatever, who's the victim? Your family. You just crushed your whole family because you were the sole supporter. This is what it is to be in criminal justice. So you start with that arraignment. You get that indictment. You read that indictment. You read it because you are trying to prepare to make the system function the way it's supposed to function. Those of you who are not willing to do that, step off, find another job. Those of you who are doing it for the money, step out of our community. We don't need you in our community like that. Not anymore. Those of you who just love the attention, who think you grand, that. It's not time for you to be grand. The person who has to be grand is the defendant or is the victim. One of those two has to be grand, has to be treated bigger than you. But those of you who love to see justice, to see it work, to make it work, get your behinds out there and kick some butt out there. Make it work. Make, it, make any prosecutor who steps forward in front of you earn it. Any prosecutor, when you're out there, you make sure you dot your I's and you cross your T's because you have a mandate to stand for justice. When you get that indictment, you make sure you did it right. You make sure you did it based on the evidence. The indictment. After you read it, now you have pretrial discovery. Discovery is that part of the game that you, you, you can win and lose on. I used to have a practice where no matter what, uh, I would send a letter to the prosecutor's office and I would request almost everything at the kitchen sink. Because if you never request it, they never have to turn, they never will turn it over to you. But if you request it and it turns out to be relevant and they haven't turned it over to you, you have an argument that they're withholding evidence. Brady material is material that is exculpatory, meaning evidence that helps prove your innocence. They have to turn that over as a matter of law. If they don't, mistrial, game over, you win. But you have to establish that this was exculpatory. Not that it just helped, but it could have demonstrated your innocence and the prosecutor knew about it and never turned it over. Now, what, what would be some examples of Brady material? A confession from someone else. DNA evidence that connected someone else to the case that they never turned over to you because they wanted to prove they got five confessions from you, little Central Park joggers. Exculpatory evidence that would show that you could not have committed the crime. A tape of you leaving the bar before the shootout. Mm -hmm. Evidence, exculpatory evidence, things that would show that you could not have committed the crime. If they know that and they don't turn it over, then game over. Once you realize it, game over. Another pretrial practice. So when you prepare as a lawyer, when you prepare your, your discovery letter, put everything in it. If there's a cop in your case, if you get a police report and there's a cop in your case, write, ask what was his shift? What shift was he on? What shift did he work? He says he rested the guy at 7 o'clock. That's 7 o'clock p.m. That's the second shift. So, request it. Well, on what, on this, on, during this time frame, what shift was he working? Um, can you outline what shift he was working? You're not allowed to have interrogatories. Interrogatories is a civil uh, uh, remedy where you can ask questions. You can ask questions and they have to answer the questions. But by virtue of the fact that the officer will put 7 o'clock was the arrest, then you get the right to ask what shift was he working? Because you're going to probably ask him something similar to that in your examination or cross-examination if the matter goes to trial. So ask for it. What can they do? Say no. We're not giving you that information. So they say no. But if it turns out to be relevant and they said no, you get to say to the judge, I requested that. What's going on here? I requested this information. You know. Ask for everything. Ask uh, 
for uh, what unit he worked with. Because most times they work with partners. They work with two or three or four people. They have these meetings early in the morning if they're police officers, or they have move, meetings when their shifts start as to what they're going to do. All right? Sometimes those become relevant. Uh, like when they say, you know, you see on, um, on uh, what was that the show? We used to, they used to gather, and, and then they, the guy would give them all the instructions for the day, and they would go out and, and all right, well, we're looking for a black male today with a red hat, so-and-so-and-so, robbed the grocery store at the Mandamin Mall. Okay, so everybody's running around, riding around the street looking for a guy with a red hat. And then they stop your guy, and he's got on a black hat, and they say, well, he's fit the description. Of the, of the perp. And so now it becomes relevant as to what description they were given of the perp earlier that day. So you get to ask for that because of its relevance. And you get to use it if you're smart and you're able to get it from them. Nine times out of ten they won't give it to you and nine times out of ten a judge won't give it to you unless you're able to establish that it has some particular relevance. But that's where your pretrial motion process comes in. You get to sneak questions like that in. You know, like, for example, you submit a motion to suppress. I'm going to submit a motion to suppress because I believe it was an illegal motor vehicle stop and therefore a legal seizure, which found the gun and found the drugs. But when I'm questioning the officer, I got my mind toward trial. So I'm asking him, well, wait a minute. Now, didn't you have, as part of your discussion earlier that afternoon when you came on, that you were looking for a, a red car, that there was a red car out there? He might be smart enough to say, yeah. And my client had a red car, right? Yeah. And that's the reason why you stopped him, because of what you had going on earlier in the afternoon, not because you saw any crime or anything like that committed. No. But now you've gotten into the other things that you want to get into, and you got an answer on the record that will allow you on cross-examination to expand it even further, because you outsmarted them. You thought beyond just that motion that's in front of you. That's what it is to lawyer. That's what it is that's about. That's why when you try to hire a lawyer, you go watch them work because you're not just watching somebody put on a performance. You're watching somebody who is setting up something with every question for the long haul and for the big day when you have to stand there and face 12 people and argue. They didn't prove their case. My client is innocent. Uh, this is all a make-believe. This guy is lying. So you use every piece of information that you gather for that kind of proof. This is what it is to lawyer. Another thing that I always do after I write my exhaustive letter uh, to the prosecutor, um, I wait to see what kind of discovery they're going to send me back, and then I start filing motions. Um, motion to dismiss the indictment is always an intriguing one. Uh, most judges will deny it, but you're looking for things like duplicity. You're looking for things like the thing I explained to you with the uh, uh, evidence that was not presented to the grand jury, but the grand jury voted on it anyway, like whether or not it was a peppermint versus whether or not it was a, a, a butterscotch. That becomes relevant in that motion. But you want to attack it because, again, uh, sometimes it's a waste of time, but sometimes what you want to do is waste some time. You know, you want to get a gauge. You want to let the prosecutor know that they're in for a fight. You know, you don't want to just roll over. You want them to see that this is, you know, we, we're in this, I'm in this to win. I'm not in this to, and sometimes just the sheer magnitude of the motions and the preparation that you go through is enough for the prosecutor to say, oh man, Muhammad, come on, you're going to file another motion? And I'm like, yep. Well, look, maybe, maybe what, what if I offer your guy this? Because look, prosecutors are human too. They're not automatons. They're not machines. They don't want to be up all night researching your motions, whether they have merit or not. Now, if they have the biggest case in town, then yeah, they want to be up all night because they want to get on TV just like everybody else. They want to be moved from just an uh, ADA, Assistant uh, Deputy Attorney General or Assistant Prosecutor, to becoming the head prosecutor and maybe a, a councilman or a senator somewhere down the road. It's all political. Or they just want to stay on state-sponsored welfare, which is what uh, the, the prosecutor's office most times is, public assistance. Uh, but that's what they do. All right? And so you want to put their feet to the fire if you really believe in it. All right. Um, last but not least, you file your motions. You file your motion to suppress if there's a search. You file your motion to dismiss if there's any hint that there's something that was not right in the grand jury. You file your motion for additional discovery and you use that additional discovery because these motions allow you opportunities on many occasions to question the witnesses that come into court. 
I have an identification. I identify this person. Okay, you have a right to a hearing to determine whether or not that identification was admissible, was done according to the record. So you file that motion. There's a confidential informant. Oh yeah, there's a confidential informant. You are not entitled to a confidential informant to know who the confidential informant is unless you can establish that the confidential informant was a participant in the crime. But you file your motion. You file your motion and then you find, you find that link between the participant in the crime who you think is the confidential informant because sometimes it can be only one person. It could be only one person who's the confidential informant. So you say, it's so-and-so and make them come out and say, no, it's not. If they intend to call a confidential informant as a witness, they'll disclose it to you. Otherwise, they are not, you are not entitled to have it disclosed. And many times, they're not even entitled to say that they got the information from a confidential source at a jury trial. But preliminarily, you want to test it because you might get lucky. You want to know in your preliminary motions whether or not uh, a defendant uh, or a witness has a prior criminal history whether or not the, the person is an, an indicted co-conspirator or unindicted co-conspirator. You want to know all of this information, whether or not uh, uh, the person has ever testified for the state before, um, uh, how it is that the state came to find this witness. If the state found a witness in a murder trial living in public, not even public housing in Florida, and she was allegedly a witness to a murder in Newark, but she was living in Florida, and she, and she had an apartment there. The way they found her, believe it or not, was that she was still on probation. Uh, um, uh, she was still on probation in North, but she escaped to Florida. They couldn't find her at any time, but they found her for purpose of bringing her back to testify that she saw the murder that occurred. She gave a statement while she was in Florida. We knew what happened. They put pressure on her. They found her, knew that she had once lived in the same building. They needed a witness. They went down to Florida, grabbed her up, and said, we're going to violate you on your probation if you don't say so-and-so did it. And you know what she said? So-and-so did it. The problem was they didn't do what I did. They had a, a gate, uh, a, uh, 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 a, a metal door. You have to get buzzed in. So I'm sitting there like for about an hour waiting for somebody to come out the door. You know how you're doing the project, right? Uh, so you wait for the door to buzz, boom, you walk in like you live there. Security guard says like, uh, I know you're, no, brother, I'm here. I got a um, subpoena. I'm getting ready to deliver it to apartment so-and-so and so-and-so. He says, ain't nobody in here. I said, well, let me put it on the door. He said, nobody lives there. I said, well, how long has nobody lived there? Now this guy's giving me information that suggests that the witness did not live there at that time. So I said, can you do me a favor, brother? This is a murder case. Help me out. He goes up, gets the landlord. The landlord opens up the door. Boom. I look out the window that she said that the, she looked out to see the murder was only reflected the front of the building the murder occurred in the backyard. She has no access to the window. So I take my phone out, I start taking pictures, bop, 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 bop. All right, obviously you gotta turn that kind of stuff over to the prosecutor's office. I said, now speak to your detectives about how it is that they came to get this witness to say that she saw the murder from her window. This is her apartment. Here's the evidence that shows that she was on probation. Here's the apartment number. Here's the apartment. Here's a picture of the door with the apartment. Here's a picture of the landlord with the key to the apartment. She didn't live there at that time. And even if she did, she couldn't have seen it from there. That plea bargain went from uh, uh, murder down to manslaughter, from manslaughter down to reckless manslaughter, from reckless manslaughter down to unlawful possession of a weapon. My client had been in 18 months. He took that uh, unlawful possession of a weapon because it meant he would walk the next day even though he said he didn't commit any crime and he didn't have a gun, but he took the plea. But that was on him. He wanted to do that, and, I, and frankly, the lawyer has to bring that to you. He has to tell you they're making you this offer in order for you to take this plea. You have to admit that you had this, that you did X, Y, Z conduct. Can you admit to that? Will you admit to that under oath? And you know how many times they'll change their mind about it and say, yeah, I'll, I'll, I told you before. I know some cats who will plead to killing JFK and they're only 18 years old. They wouldn't even know JFK if they saw him on a movie. But they'll plead guilty to it if the number's right. This is the nature of the system that you're in. Pre-trial discovery is as important as anything else you're going to do. Pre-trial motions put you in the game. If there's a confession, you have a right to challenge the confession with a hearing. You get to bring the cops in and say, how did they confess? 
That means you cross-examine these cops. Wow, you get to cross-examine them before a jury hears you cross-examine them. And you get to set up the cross-examination. You get to hear them and set up the cross-examination that you go, the real cross-examination that's going to come when you get into trial. But you're still trying to win that motion because if you knock the confession out, you know you got a, a, a good shot. But if you knock identification out, identification in most jurisdictions is something that the state has to prove beyond a reasonable doubt as well, meaning that they have to prove each and every element of the case that's in your indictment, each and every element of the charge, and identification beyond a reasonable doubt. They have to prove that it was you. So if you knock out an identification, case closed, you won. That comes from pretrial preparation. That's why these motions are important. Stay to them. Stay to them. And then sometimes you have to be smart on them. Sometimes you have to be smart enough to say, I got a motion, but I know this person. I'm, if, I, if, I, if I take this motion now, I'm going to give away a defense. Because if I lose on the motion, they're going to know where I'm coming from. So one time I backed off of the motion. I had a motion for an identification. And I backed off of it. And I said to the client, I said, look, this is a gamble, but I think this is a winning motion. I said, I think it's not, it's not a winning motion, but it's a win at trial. He said, I'm going to trust you. I, I've seen you work. I know what you do. I know you put the hours in. I know you put the time in. So we go to trial. There are three defendants, two Latino boys, one black Haitian boy, and me. I represent the black Haitian boy, two Latino boys represented by two white lawyers. When it comes time for the witness who did the identification to come in, a cop, he comes in and he says, I saw the kid uh, bring a bag into a barbershop. And he brings the bag into the barbershop and he puts it down, da 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 He goes, he gets into his car and we raided, we found the guns and we found the drugs in the bag and we charged him with it. And they say, can you look around the courtroom and see the person and tell us who it was that uh, did the crime. My client had on the funkiest blue suit, the freshest haircut, the funkiest tie, and all the books, all of my books in front of him. And normally you sit defense attorney, defendant, defense attorney, defendant, defense attorney, defendant. Me, that entire trial, I sat defense attorney, white boy, nice, good intelligent white boy too. And, I, and it's not an insult for me to call him a white boy. He used to call himself white boy. Uh, European, European. Uh, he sat, his defendant. The next one sat, his defendant, and then my defendant, and then me. So when the cop got up and he looked down, because he's looking for the black guy who committed the crime, who dropped off the bag, he says, there he is right there. All he did was count the numbers. Lawyer, defendant, lawyer, defendant, lawyer, defendant. And he pointed at me. And I knew he would. My client was dressed. He had a pencil in his hand. He was taking notes and he was writing. I told him, keep writing. Bismillah, bismillah, bismillah. When I looked at his book, he had written it a thousand times. <laughs> so, but it looked like he was taking notes while the guy was being questioned. And the cat identified me. Now, just so that you know, I've been identified six times in criminal complaints. I was like, dang, do I look that criminal-minded? DJ, I look that criminal-minded to you? Nah, Dean, I look that criminal-minded? I always thought I was like the nice guy of the family. Jeez, and right. But yeah, he picked me. And you, and you know, when the, when the, when the judge said, when, when they identify someone, the judge will say to you, um, identifying so-and-so for the record, you can see that he identified your client, Mr. Bashir. And I just sat there. And the judge said, Mr. Bashir, and I just sat there. And then finally the judge registered what I was doing. Now, I was not going to let this guy off the hook. The prosecutor realized that he was identifying me, walked around and tried to stand behind my client and me and said, which one? So he stands behind my client. That's the hint to the witness that identify him. This is the guy. And he said, not that one, the one next to him. Now it's blown out the box. And my client looks at me and just smiles. And he said, how did you know he was going to do that? I knew. I just knew. There's some things that happen in a courtroom process, like when you walk in the door and the guy gives you like, like the stare, like you're the criminal, or the client walks in and he's carrying your briefcase and they give him the respect. 
<laughs> he saw him in the hallway. He opened the door for my client. And I said, bruh, we got this. You have to trust me on this. We got this. We waived the preliminary motion. Let's go straight to trial. And that's exactly what he did. He identified me. My client walked. The other guys had deadlocked juries, from my understanding. But my client walked. There's no way to identify him. They had no identification. The judge had to throw it out. But that's what it is. That's lawyering, though. That's when you take your preliminary motions and you take your preliminary discovery and you put it all together and you come up with a strategy. You just don't read it on the day of trial and say, yeah, no, he lied on this. See that one right there where he said, I was running? I wasn't running. I was jogging. Yeah, right. You're going to jail. All right? Or when you take the gun, you're the lawyer and you say, um, 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 uh, what, what, what did you say he said? What did you say? What what did you say he said? Meaning you didn't read the file. What did you say he said? Because you're asking him a question to like have the jury hear the guy tell you that your client said he did it another time. Why would I ask the question where they going the guys gonna come out and say, well, you already testified in direct examination and the client said, um, the guy said it's not my gun, or the uh, that 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 gun is registered. And so now I'm gonna ask them, did he say the gun was registered? Now I got the jury gotta hear it again. And maybe a third time, because the prosecutor's gonna say, what did, you, what did he say when you said it? So that they can hear the third time you getting them to admit the officer sounds credible because he said something that your client said. Lawyering. But that comes with preparation. When you've read it, you know, I'm not asking that question. I'm not touching that. And if the prosecutor doesn't touch it, don't you touch it. That's what preliminary motions do. They put you in a position to win. They put you in a position to put pressure on. They put you in a, a position to get to learn your witness because the system is designed for you to fail. You have to take what they give you, the lemons that they give you, and you have to find a way to make lemonade. If your life is on the line, you get your discovery from your lawyer. You find out what motions he's filed and you read them and you follow up on them. If you love your own life, if you love your family, if you want to be free, you fight like hell for your life. This is what it's about. This is criminal justice 101. And this is just the preliminaries. I'm just giving you the preliminaries. I haven't really sunk my teeth into you yet. But we're going to get there. You're going to get a trial out of me. And you're going to walk away from this understanding what it's really about. This system is about you. Just like the concept of that, that you're hearing in the media of racism, redefining it is about you. It is always about you. Learn, learn, learn. There's nothing wrong with an education. Last but not least. How much time we got there, DJ? Got me two minutes? I got two minutes? Yeah. All right, I got two minutes, folks. Next week, we're going to talk about... Next week, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do something I think is a little bit special. I'm going to talk to you about, I'm, gonna, I'm just going to jump over a couple of preliminary things and I'm going to go through something that's called opening statements. Some of you sit here and you listen to opening statements in a, a TV show or in a movie, etc. And you really don't understand the import of that first impression. So opening statement is going to be given to you in the full picture of, a, of the perception of you again. We're going back to perception. Perception is you being young, black, Latino, poor white versus the system that has power, the cop that has a pride, that cop that has an indicia of credibility, you versus that, how you have to overcome that. And sometimes you overcome it, and, and most times you overcome it with everything that you do in a courtroom, every way, the way you walk, the way you dress, your hairstyle, your smell, your, ability, your willingness to stand when the, when the judge comes out. Jurors and people around the courtroom are watching everything that you do, and you have to understand perception in a way. So when I started this course, Raw Law, I started you with perception because I said it would permeate everything that goes on in the system. Here's how it permeates in pretrial motions. No judge wants to grant pretrial motions. I'm, they can say whatever they want to about being fair and impartial. We're going to talk about judges. We're going to talk about plea bargains down the road and what their functions are. But none of them want to grant a pretrial motion that could potentially throw a case out. They want to follow the law because they believe in the law. But if that law says I got to throw out two kilos of cocaine, 
I got to throw out a, 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 a car full of guns that were about ready to be exploded on the, on the community. I'm not so sure I want to do that. But that's the same thing with bail. If I let this guy go and he's charged with a gun and he goes out and kills somebody, what am I, you know, can you imagine what I'm going to look like in the press? It's always about perception. So they are looking out to, 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 to do their job, but also to look good to make sure that nobody perceives them as being soft on crime or any of those other foolish kind of conversations that they had. Of so, course, soft on crime means just soft on black folks. Truth be told, soft on poor folks because crime is a poor thing. It's a concept created for the poor. It's not created for the rich. I mean, who committed more, is committing more crimes right now than the government, you know? So you don't see none of them going to jail. You don't see any bankers going to jail. You don't see any stockbrokers going to jail. You just see cats who took a $20 bill out of somebody's wallet or snatched somebody's purse going to jail or selling a dime bag on the corner. Those are the ones going to jail. All right. But in the end, those are going to be the things that we're going to talk about. And we're going to bring you full circle with perception because it really is about how they see you, how you see yourself, and then the truth. This has been another edition of the Raw Law Project. If you don't know, you better ask somebody. I'm telling you, we're going to bring it and we're going to keep